Welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, your home for Pittsburgh Penguins news and analysis. You can find us on YouTube at Tip of the Iceberg or anywhere you get your podcast from. I'm your host, Nick Belsky, joined as always by Nick Horwad, and it was a busy day one of free agency for most teams, including the Pittsburgh Penguins, who offloaded a contract for future assets. We'll get into that trade here in just a little bit. But they also brought in nine players on day one of free agency. We'll talk about most of them and then look forward to what is remaining for Kyle Dubas and the Pittsburgh Penguins this offseason. A lot to get to, Horwat, so let's get started on this one. And let's start with the Penguins' decision to trade Riley Smith. It was a decision that it feels like was made a while ago, but now we finally have a resolution to that storyline. The Penguins send Riley Smith to the New York Rangers with 25% of his salary retained, which is $1.25 million for the 2024-25 season. In return, they get a 2027 second-round pick and a 2025 fifth round pick your thoughts on the finally resolution to the riley smith trade discussions from this summer yeah like you said finally or it's been or it's already been determined yeah this trade just felt like a long time coming it was just a matter of finding the right trade partner and deciding what kind of return the penguins wanted they settled on just a couple of draft picks and retaining some salary which you were gonna probably have to do if you Mm -hmm. weren't throwing in more pieces. Uh, it, it was just purely, this trade just looked like it was purely getting Riley Smith off the roster um, because things didn't work out. Riley Smith might go on and have a really good year in New York. We, If you're a Penguins, Penguins fan, you cannot be upset at that because uh, he has a track record of being a good player still. Um, mm-hmm. And part of me kind of expects him to go on and do pretty good things for the rest of his career, but the fit just wasn't here in Pittsburgh. That's all it was. And, Loading up on draft picks has been Dubas's forte uh, since getting here. He didn't uh, add too many at the most recent draft, but he also didn't send any away. So uh, he's going to have some picks to really revamp everything down the line. And mm-hmm. uh, if, for what it's worth, and we're going to have this whole episode not even discuss the draft, which a lot of people seem to be happy with, which is mm-hmm. a good step in the right direction for the Penguins. And um, when it comes to free agency the deal with riley smith um i'd say the team is trending in the correct direction and it all started with uh dealing riley smith and getting most of that Mm -hmm. contract off the books you mentioned trending in the right direction i think that depends on who you ask and what direction they think the penguins should go in the penguins direction and we'll talk about in a little bit what it seems like kyle dubas's direction is for this organization but when you look at the trades, I mean, first and foremost, the trade should tell you what the direction he's headed in. He traded, if you look at his last two trades over this past weekend, he traded Riley Smith for a second, a fifth, Kevin Hayes, and another second, essentially. Because that's mm-hmm. that's the out versus in on his last two trades. And that points to one thing, which is a, a retool or rebuild, depending on who you ask, what the Penguins are heading towards. But we'll get into that in a little bit. As far as the Riley Smith thing, you hit the nail on the head. It was only a matter of time before this happened. 13 goals, 40 points, and 76 games played. He just didn't fit with the Penguins. And by the end of the season, it was evident, especially considering he was playing on the third line with Lars Eller and Valtteri Pustin. And then, yeah, he started to find his footing a little bit. But I think we can all agree that if you were paying $5 million to Riley Smith to be on that third line, you really kind of wasting that salary cap space, especially – when you can go out there and get, in my opinion, surprisingly, more than you paid for him. I understand you have to retain $1.25 million, but as far as future assets is concerned, you traded away a third-round pick, which is not a, a nothing asset, to get Riley Smith. Now, you thought that you were getting a much better version of Riley Smith, but at the end of the day, you flip him after a down season for a second-round pick and a fifth-round pick, and, and that's good asset management from Kyle Dubas. Now, there are the things that... You know, I didn't particularly like from Kyle Dubas, but I will give him credit where it's due. I think his two trades this weekend were pretty decent for the Penguins. Not that I love the Kevin Hayes addition, but at the same time, I can see the point, especially whenever you're looking at a team that is is not going to go for a Stanley Cup next year. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting... The Kevin Hayes thing is going to be a little interesting. It'll be the obvious... He's going to fill out as a third-line center. 
he can shift to wing if he needs to. Uh, if he's bad enough, you drop him to fourth. I don't know what else to say, but uh, you got to keep the expectations high. I'm sure I bagged on Kevin Hayes on this show years ago, but yeah. uh, here we are. It's a new era. We are moving along, and wow. he uh, could absolutely be a useful asset for the Penguins if given the right opportunity, given the right mm-hmm. situation. He's not you know, costing the Penguins a ton of money. I think that's a pretty solid. That's a pretty solid sign, and man, I keep forgetting that the one draft pick from the Rangers is two years away still. But yes, got a long build ahead of them, and they're loading up. There's a ton of draft picks, and over the next three drafts that are in the Penguins' possession, that mm-hmm. like I said, Cal Dubas likes adding them. And if they realize, hey, that they they can go for something, let's say they're in a pretty good spot come trade deadline. You're still holding on to three first round picks if you want to go add or if you want mm-hmm. to ship out on any other number of picks for something. Uh, you never know because hockey is weird. Um, and you can't doubt Sidney Crosby sometimes. Yeah, I think they would have to be in a really, really good position, like top three, easily in the Metro position to trade away one of those first round picks. I don't think. I don't think it's going to be easy to to pry those away from Kyle Dubas, especially considering the direction that he seems to want to take this team. But, you know, to close out the Riley Smith thing, for one, Penguins will play, and this was announced yesterday as well amidst all the craziness, the Penguins will play opening night on October 9th at PPG Paints Arena against the New York Rangers and against Riley Smith. That's a recipe for disaster if you're the Penguins on opening night because you know Riley Smith is going to make a significant impact in one way or other against his former team that night. Eh, it's unless he doesn't want to be in New York either. I, I, find that to I, I find it hard to believe. I mean, I personally love New York. I know there's some people that don't like it, but, you know, Riley Smith, he might have wanted to be a Southwestern guy, but we'll see what he ends up doing in New York. Yeah, I just wanted to throw one more jab out there. Yeah, I'm sure he's going to do fine. It's uh, It just wasn't the right situation for him in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. And if the Penguins are lucky, he keeps on to the same trend, at least for game one. Yeah, at least for game one and maybe the three or four other times the Penguins end up playing the New York Rangers next season. The the question that I have before we get to the nine players signed on opening day of free agency, is there anyone else after Riley Smith, especially after you've seen now where some of the dust is settled, is there anyone else that you see Dubas moving out this offseason? Via trade, I should say. For a trade, it, I mean, the offseason isn't over. I could still see the Tristan Jari situation going in a step further, and I'm sure he's still looking for some sort of taker on Ryan Graves. It's the way that they still kind of want to bring P.O. Joseph back but haven't been able to yet, and yet they signed a player, Matt Grizzick, which we'll get into. There's a, there's a log jam all of a sudden if they decide to bring P.O. Joseph back, so mm-hmm. maybe Ryan Graves is still on the block. Who knows? That one seems less likely, but... Uh, I'm sure you just keep that you keep that uh, thing in the fire until someone strikes, maybe. Yeah, especially with the performance he had and the contract he has. But for the most part, I doubt that he ends up getting moved simply because of that contract, because of how poor he was last season. When I look at now, after yesterday, who I think could potentially be on the block, that's Lars Eller or Nola Chari. Obviously, Kyle Dubas is saying that he wants to weaponize salary cap space. He wants to bring in some pretty decent assets. Lars Eller was pretty good last year for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And I think if there's a team that's out there that needs a depth center at this point of the offseason, they'd be willing to pay uh, a decent draft asset or maybe uh, a B prospect or maybe even a C prospect, which the Penguins, you know, you can't be choosy when your prospect system looks the way the Penguins does. But I think what's telling to me about that and the reason that I've kind of changed my tune on that after yesterday is they signed three center capable guys, right? They traded for Kevin Hayes, who Kyle Dubas said yesterday, they're going to look for him to play center out the gates. Blake Lazat, who will get to play center. And according to, you know, Puckpedia, Anthony Ubovillier, who is likely going to be a winger with the Pittsburgh Penguins, has center capabilities as well. So you have all of these guys, not to mention a Sam Poulin, not to mention a Vasily Ponomarev, not to mention, I believe Jonathan Gruden has played center before as well. You have a lot of center-capable guys, and while I, I do like the fact that the Hayes move bumps down Eller to 4C and maybe you know Lazat can fit in where he fits best, it opens the door for you to get some more assets, and considering Kyle Dubas is saying that he wants to 
you know, start this kind of asset, you know, collection, I, I think Eller or Achari could end up being on the other side of that. Yeah, it, Achari seems less likely uh, just because of the way Dubas has spoken on Noel Achari before. Uh, when it comes to Lars Eller, though, I agree with you that it always kind of felt like he could be a trade piece this summer, and I forget who had it now, whether it was uh, Yost, whether it was Rossi or Yoey. Um, Buffalo was in on something, or there was something with Buffalo involved there. Mm -hmm. uh, so perhaps maybe that is another log on the fire of deals that um, Dubas might be looking to make and Lars Eller finding – you know, his own way out of here. So it's going to be interesting. And you're right. I think at least when it comes to it, Lars Eller is another name that absolutely could be uh, among the names. He would fall into the main three that are left. Let's move over and talk a little bit about the nine players. I, you know, a lot of people are saying, no, the Penguins, they, they didn't do very much of anything on the opening day of free agency. They signed nine players. Mm -hmm. That is not nothing. And let's go down through uh, the nine, and then we'll go to a, a certain amount of them, uh, certain ones that we want to discuss, some of the bigger names. Uh, but started off left-handed defenseman Matt Grizzlick. One-year deal, $2.75 million. A lot of people not happy about that. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, also on the left-handed defense side, Ryan Shea. One year, 775 k He can play the left or right. Did both last season. Comes in and basically you kind of locked up your seventh defenseman with Ryan Shea. You bring in left winger slash center slash right winger, wherever he really needs to go. Anthony Beauvillier, one year, $1.25 million. Blake Lazat comes in, two years, $1.85 million. We're definitely going to talk about Lazat. Uh, Emil Bemstrom is back. That's a name that I was super excited to see, but we'll see what he's able to do in a, a second stint and a second opportunity in Pittsburgh. One year, 775 k league minimum, not bad. And then four. American Hockey League players, because as we had mentioned going into free agency, they really didn't have any defensemen, and they needed to restock because they let a lot of those forwards go. Of Vinny Henestroza, who went and signed with Dallas, I believe. They let go of uh, Redeem Zahorna, who they haven't at least uh, had any interest in bringing back to this point. But they signed four a AHL players to NHL deals, including Boko Imama, Mac Hollowell, Nathan Clerman, and Jimmy Huntington. Horwat? Let's start with the name that I think caught the most heat yesterday, and that's Matt Grizzlick. I don't personally understand the hate on this one. What were your thoughts on the Grizzlick signing? I don't totally hate it either. I get where people are coming from. He was scratched for the last, like, 11 of their last 12, uh, the Bruins. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers didn't match up with what they're used to, with what the Bruins are used to when it comes to Matt Grizzlick, but also... Uh, it's not like he was a minus player. He's never been a minus player in his career. So there's some sort of puck moving ability that he has that mm -hmm. uh, the Penguins are going to look to take advantage of. Him. I think that was the main part of main reason why they got him. He's not going to be your first line guy. He's not going to be unless it comes down to it. Cause he's on the left side. Um, but he's going to be a solid puck mover for a team that could use a bit of, uh, transition out of their own zone at times it we'll see how the defensive game plays out but also much in the way that we discussed ryan graves last year this is a good signing this is going to be good for the team it's a bit long but so be it um then it turned out to be a bit of a disaster you have to look at this it's looking like a disaster now it can flip the other way too you never know what's mm -hmm. going to happen on a player entering a new system entering a new season even um i get that on the surface, it looks scary, but you got to do your best to withhold judgment until you see something on the ice, or at least, you know, or at least not overreact until you see something on the ice. I'm glad you mentioned new system in there, because when you look at when Matt Grizzlick really started to fall off, it coincides directly with a coaching change, right? They went from Bruce Cassidy to Jim Montgomery and Grizzlick's numbers started taking hit, not only mentioning the fact that you know, he dealt with injury last year as well early in the season, and that can affect, you know, your play throughout a year. You look at Chris Letang. He was injured early in the season, and his play slowly deteriorated through the season. But I think the big thing that I look at with Grizzlick, yeah, he's had a couple of down seasons, and whether it be because of injury or coaching change, that is the performance that he put out on the ice. And I think that's the reason he got a one-year deal, right? Yeah. 2.75 is a, is a decent chunk of change. But also, look at the fact that the Penguins didn't have very much to spend. 
They needed a top four capable guy, and they're already spending a lot of money on Ryan Graves, on Chris Letang, on Eric Carlson, on Marcus Pedersen for next season. They needed somebody that could play bonus up in the lineup, top minutes, somebody that's handled that before, somebody that's played with a defenseman similar to Chris Letang, and he has with Charlie McAvoy. And I think Grizzly checks a lot of those boxes. Is he the most flashy signing? No. Would I have rather seen Jacob Chikrin? You know, if the salary cap wasn't anything, if trading assets wasn't anything you had to take into consideration, I know that Washington got them for a steal. But again, would I have liked to see a guy like Jacob Chikrin? Yeah, I would have preferred that. But at the end of the day, with what they could do, with what they were handcuffed in because of what they're already spending, I don't hate the Matt Grizzlick signing. And I also think that there's been a lot of revisionist history about P.O. Joseph's season after this signing, um, yeah. but I'll let you respond before I get into that. No, I just, it, you also mentioned new system. Let's not forget that Matt Grizzly spent three years of his college career being coached by uh, David Quinn, mm -hmm. who is now in the Penguins, uh, behind the Penguins bench as the defensive coach. Um, so David Quinn's going to be tasked with revamping the career for the final years, for at least the latter years of Eric Carlson, bringing uh, Chris Tang up another step, this upcoming season, and now maybe even a quick reclamation project on Matt Grizzlick, a mm -hmm. guy he is familiar with and had relative success with. I'd have to look into the deeper details. Uh, relative success with it at Boston University. So keep that in mind, too, that there is that connection there, and that could be a net positive for the Penguins. Mm -hmm. Now, the big thing, I before we move over and talk a little bit about Anthony Beauvillier, a lot of people are saying, well, I would have just rather brought back P.O. Joseph and put him into that position because, you know, P.O. Joseph is still young. He has uh, some untapped potential. Sure. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of people that are saying, you saw what he did at the end of the season. Wasn't, it wasn't that great, guys. Like, it was, it was better. It was better than Ryan Graves, which is why I think a lot of people have rose-colored glasses on it. But we're so far removed from actually – seeing those games and seeing the play on the ice that a lot of people are forgetting that P.O. Joseph wasn't the next best thing at the end of the season, right? He wasn't yeah. a guy that is, you know, undeniable to bring back. <laughs> and at the end of the day, if you're bringing somebody back and you're trying to keep things open going into the future, especially on a left side where there are a lot of question marks, Marcus Pedersen, we'll get into that later this summer. Uh, Owen Pickering, how far does he develop? There's a lot of question marks on that left side. Do you really want to eat up more years with a guy that at his best is nowhere near what Grizzly was at his best? So if you can get Grizzly to his best, he's an analytical darling. He's a guy that played top pair minutes with Char Charlie McAvoy in some of their best seasons together. I, I think that if you can get that out of Grizzly, there's not even a question that it's better than bringing back P.O. Joseph. Because yeah, let's not forget about this with P.O. Joseph. He was healthy scratch for a good chunk of the season to start. And... Yeah. He wasn't put into that first line position because he was good. The Penguins didn't have a choice. No, it was out of the press box and onto the top line for him. Yep. They didn't have a choice. It was all right, here we go. Let's get let's give it a go. And it happened to be okay. It happened to be fine. Good. Yeah, it worked it, out. That's great. That doesn't mean it's going to again. Also, mm -hmm. is Pio Joseph a lock if they bring it back? Is he or even without Matt Grizz? Like, was he a lock to hold that position again? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Again, it wasn't because he worked his way there. It was because the team didn't have a choice. Yeah. So again, I, the door is not shut on Pierre Olivier Joseph. Kyle Dubas mentioned that. But if you're bringing him back, the best thing that I can say about that is there's going to be competition. Whereas mm -hmm. without that, I don't know if Ryan Shea's really pushing one of those three guys for a spot in the lineup every day. It's just Shea's a little bit of a injury, you know, injury help because you saw what he was able to do with Jack St. Ivany down the stretch. And that was good as well. But, you know, Grizzlick, I, I saw a lot of people saying, you know, a lot of doomsday after the Grizzlick signing. And I was like, it, it's listen, he wasn't good the last two seasons, but let's not act like he hasn't been good. And let's not act like that was eight years ago. It was two seasons ago. Who knows a new system, a new coach, Mike Sullivan might bring a little bit more than, Jim Montgomery did for specifically for Matt Grizzlick. So again, we'll have to wait and see uh, what's up with that. Let's move over and talk a little bit about Anthony Beauvillier because it was a similar reaction to Beauvillier, somebody that we put at number two on the you know top free agents to watch for the Penguins. And that was simply because he was going to be cheap 
and it feels like he just fits with the Penguins. A uh, couple days later, Beauvillier is a member of the Pittsburgh Penguins. What are your thoughts on this one? Boom. We said Anthony Beauvillier sounds like he'd be a good fit for the good fit in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh went out and signed him, and everyone freaked out. Yeah. Uh, except for us, because you can't go listen. It, much like Grizzly, one year deal. All right, good start. Uh, getting him for a season. If you want to trade him because he's not good later for nothing, do it. Who cares? You're moving on. At, at the point that the Penguins are at, it is bringing in guys for a season, two seasons maybe. Mm-hmm. Moving on afterwards. If you can bring Anthony Beauvillier in for a good season and he does some good work, he helps out the bottom six, refines the game that made him solid in New York, then you've got then you're cooking. That is, it's a low risk signing, guys. I, I get that. I, I get with you see the analytical numbers of, of recent with Grizzly, Bovillier, or these guys. But I'll tell you what, who cares? It's a season. It's gonna they're gonna enter a new system. You can't overreact this early. And I think it's just a good choice. It's a low risk option. He's gonna come in and help the bottom six the best way he can. It's hard to judge the bottom six this po- at this point of the summer, too. Mm-hmm. Little aside here. Yeah. I enjoy the analytic side of hockey, right? Yeah. I'm I've somebody that has embraced it. I've tried to learn as much as I can about it. And to be frank, I'm still not as in the weeds as I'd like to be. I want to continue to learn. Mm-hmm. But the amount of people that just take, and I love Jay Fresh, you know, friend of the show, the amount of people that just take the Jay Fresh hockey card see red and take that as gospel and just post that and say, Oh, how about we realize that these are more than just numbers on a paper. These are humans. Yep. When you look at last season, it was bad for Anthony Beauvillier that much. You could sell on the ice and on the spreadsheet, but let's not forget. There's a human element of this. The guy was traded twice, twice in the middle of the season. He's played on four teams in the last two years. And I'm not saying that he's going to come to Pittsburgh and he's going to be, you know, some great piece to the bottom six. What I'm saying is let's not bury the guy, a guy who has had previous success in the NHL and more specifically in the metropolitan division before he even steps foot on Pittsburgh ice. Not only that he's had success in the Metro division. He has shown that he has offensive upside and he's a bottom six addition. And that's the thing that I, I, I don't understand with the hate on the Hayes deal the hate on the Beauvillier deal is you look at those two, you look at Yesapul Yarvi, you look at Emil Bemstrom, which is why I haven't screamed and raved and ranted about him coming back. They will all be bumped for the prospects that are in the system if those prospects prove to be ready. Yep. As of right now, these are placeholders. That's why it's one year for Beauvillier. That's why it's one year for Bemstrom. That's why, you know, Hayes has two years left, but at the same time, you could move on from that as the St. Louis Blues did. That's why Paul Yarvey has one year left on his contract. Because if these young guys are better, then put them on waivers. Mm -hmm. Send them to the minors. It's not going to hurt you that much. So that's why I don't mind this move. I understand that people say, well, he had a bad season last year. But also, this is a bottom six piece for a team that is not going to a Stanley Cup. You have to realize that it's not going to be that enticing for top free agents to come to Pittsburgh. Not to mention, Kyle Dubas mentioned it on Friday in Vegas saying basically, don't expect anything flashy in free agency. Beauvillier fits right into that mold. Nothing flashy, flashy, excuse me, doesn't move the needle much, but it is an expected move that at the end of the day fills out the roster with somebody that at his best could be a difference maker, could be an impact player for the Penguins this season. Kyle Dubas said he's looking for one to two year guys. He has signed one to two year guys. I, I, did, the, yeah. did the Penguins fail yesterday because they didn't go out and get Jake DeBrusque for that contract? Or, oh, my God, that was an awful contract. Or whoever else even signed yesterday? No, that's not why they lost. If you think if you think they lost yesterday, I'd say they had a plan. They stuck to it. Mm-hmm. And well, Bavillier was part of it from, the, here, from very early on, too, apparently. Yeah, and the one name that was out there a lot yesterday was Jeff Skinner, and I understand it. Jeff Skinner... On the first line with Crosby, yeah, that could have been a fit. And he signed for one year and $3 million, which, yeah, the Penguins, they could have afforded. But at the end of the day, if the Penguins offered him one year, $3 million, which we'll never know, why would he not take it with the team that just went to the Stanley Cup final? Mm -hmm. It's Jeff Skinner. This is not a guy that has won copious amounts of championships in his career. If he wants to win a championship, do you want to come and play with Crosby? Yeah, that's enticing, but this team has missed the playoffs the last two years. Or do you want to sign a similar deal, a prove-it deal, and go play with either Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisettle, who were just in the Stanley Cup final? 
that's the other thing you have to look in here. There's a reason free agency is not all these great players clamoring to come to the Penguins this year. It's not, you know, a bunch of splash moves because the Penguins don't carry as much weight this year as they had in years past. And I think people need to start realizing that. Yeah, absolutely. And they will. It's like I said, it's just the quick, immediate reactions because, again, they weren't in on Steven Stamkos, Jonathan Marsh, so even Jake Gensel, if you really wanted to, because they weren't in on the big names. It's hellfire and brimstone out of Twitter. Like yeah. it's which it, represents a vocal minority of the fan base. I do understand that. Yeah, and people with a couple of followers who think they know things, but it's <laughs> it's gonna be fine. I think the team had its plan, and they'll execute their plan. And if their plan is to Trade Tristan Jari, maybe that's gonna be part of the plan. If their plan is to do other things, if their plan is to sign one of the biggest names still out there is a name we'll get into in Vladimir Tarasenko. We'll talk about it. Yeah, but if that's part of the plan, it's part of the plan. If it's not, it's not. So be it. Let's move over and talk about because it wasn't all hellfire and brimstone. There was one move that everybody was excited that the Penguins made yesterday, and that was signing Blake Lazat. Two year deal, the only multi year deal dished out by Kyle Dubas on day one. May have been the most fan-approved deal of the day. What do you think about the addition of Blake Lazat? As you texted me, quote, he is one of your guys. That's a good one. That's a good choice for, you know, undersized depth depth piece. Again, who knows how high up in the lineup he ends up making it. Um, but he's going to be there too, much like Anthony, Anthony Bovillier, fit into that bottom six, play defense from the forward perspective, and hopefully, if possible, chip in every so often. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there does still need to be an element of scoring to the bottom six that someone needs to add. Uh, Blake Lazat's just a good over, just overall a good choice. Uh, there's not too many more details to read into. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure he'll describe himself more because much like I know Matt Phillips was here for the shortest cup of coffee in the world. <laughs> um, but the way he described his game was, well, I don't have a lot of size, so I have to bring other things. Blake Lazat, according to Cap Friendly, which will soon, which will soon be a dead page, yes. uh, is about five seven. So he's got to utilize what he has at his disposal to make up for a shorter stature. Five seven. That seems like I got five nine on on NHL.com, but I mean that's, again. Yep, that's why I said I'm, uh, I'm on Cap, Cap Friendly. Friendly. I thought that's I'd it. make sure I had that specifically. That's a dead sight walking right there. Um, yes. but no, I, I like the I like the Lazat signing a lot. He's a spark plug type of guy, and at the end of the day, I think he brings much more offense than you got out of the fourth line center position last year, if that is indeed where he slots in. Because last year, you know, Achari, you mentioned it. Kyle Dubas really liked to back Nola Chari last year, but the offense just wasn't part of his game. He didn't bring anything by way of offense, and neither did Jansen Harkins, and those two played way too many games together, and I think that's not as much to do about Achari being in the lineup. Uh, but you bring in a guy like Blake Lazad, who has a little bit more scoring ability from the center ice position, a guy that is going to be you know, kind of a younger higher leveled Vinny Henestrosa that is more attuned to continuing to stay at the NHL level. That's what I, I feel like Blake Lazad is, is a better version of Vinny Henestrosa that is not NHL, AHL tweener as much as everyday NHL or at a fourth line center role. So I like it. A lot of other people liked it. So uh, that's the one move that Kyle Dubas got that everybody said, yeah, all right. I mean, they said that about the Riley Smith trade as well, getting a second oh, yeah. rounder, even if it's, you know, whenever we've all got our government pensions or whatever that is, uh, you know, that far down the future. Um, a lot of people like the Riley Smith return as well. But, you know, a couple of interesting signings. We'll obviously continue to dive into more of them and then obviously see if there's more that come along the lines. But I want to ask you final thoughts on the opening day of free agency for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Nine players signed, one player traded out, a couple of draft picks coming back in return. What were your overall thoughts on Kyle Dubas's work on July 1? I didn't hate it. It's again, he had a plan and he stuck to it. He didn't go out of his way to, I mean, initially say I'm looking for one to two year guys and then jump for a lengthy boat of a contract. He stuck to his one to two year guys. He got some good depth ad additions for with Bavillier and Lazat. Uh, who knows where Grizzly falls or ends up or even rises in the lineup. Who knows? He's got a training camp and a preseason to work. Uh, and for what it's worth, I know we didn't discuss them, those minor league contracts, or assuming they're minor league contracts, I don't totally hate either. They're a bit more, 
Last year, there was an obvious, you're getting NHLers and setting them to the, to the AHL. Mm-hmm. This time around, it is AHLers for the AHL that have NHL ability. I think <laughs> I think you put Boku Mama into the opening night lineup <laughs> just to get Matt Rempe taken care of for it for uh for what I'm assuming is a national audience. I don't know yet. Probably. Uh that's just how you start that. That's just how you start the season. Get mm-hmm. the statement out of the way. Uh he led the AHL in penalty minutes, did he not? Last like two seasons. Last season, definitely. I believe I I can't remember off the top of my head. I think career wise, he has like 300 and some penalty minutes in 100 games or something like that. So sure. it was over two penalty minutes a game. Yeah, you, I, if if he's in the, if he's in the NHL lineup, you know why he's here. If yeah, he didn't get those the, for hooking either. Yeah, it's he's a tough he's a tough customer. So I'm going to enjoy that signing. Uh, the other names aren't jumping off the page. Matt Hollowell is interesting. I think mostly because he has a Kyle Dubas connection. Didn't see that one coming, did you? Yeah, there's only a couple of those. Yeah, uh, but overall, I think even he might push for a spot mm-hmm. one day. I mean, the way the defense is filtering out, maybe he finds himself cracking the NHL again. So, um, good choices. I've enjoyed. I enjoyed day one for the Penguins. They stuck to their plan again. It, it, I'm not going to give it an A because they didn't make the big splash. They weren't in on the big names that could, you know, push the team way down the line. But for the time being, for the small plan that he set out solid good enough for me yeah the names weren't as attractive as maybe everybody had liked them to be but none mm-hmm. of the contracts are bad like yeah the one thing you can say about the grizzly contract is maybe you know i, I you would rather have them pay two million instead of 2.75 okay 750k i understand that's a league minimum contract nowadays but at the same time again he's not filling a third line role he is your going to be i would assume at the beginning of training camp, he is the guy that's playing with Chris Letang. So you're going to argue over 750K for the guy that's going to be in the top four. That's that's a hard sell for me. Uh, sorry about that. But, you know, my final thoughts, and this is a tough pill to swallow, and I believe it was Josh Yoey of The Athletic who essentially wrote this in not so many words over the weekend in one of his many pieces uh, when while in Las Vegas. This is what a real a retool looks like. It is what a retool looks like. The the quote that he had, I believe, was uh, building the future, building the next era is the only goal now. I believe that's what it was. Uh, probably missing a word or, or two in that. But I tweeted about it, so go check that out mm-hmm. on Twitter. But that's what it is. Dubis is shifting into that mode. And, and you saw a quote yesterday that I want to bring up that really highlights that, that he's, he's trying to say it in the nicest way possible that we are – starting to retool, starting to look more towards the future than worrying about trying to make this a championship team in 2024-25. He said, quote, this is not a strip it down to the stud situation here. The people in that room are too good for that. It's trying to use every method we can to acquire future assets that can come in and support the core group that is here. You saw that last year with the Jake Gensel trade. We might see one or two of uh, Panamarev or Koivun in this season make an impact at the NHL level. Uh, Cruz Lucius down the line, he, he's a pretty decent prospect as well. Um, one of those second round picks, I mean, they've obviously Jesse Marshall has a piece out in the athletic that I'm excited to read uh, about those second round picks today. They're trying, and he's trying to say in the best way possible listen, because of the respect that he has for what Malkin, Crosby, and Latang are doing. He can't strip it down because they're playing at too high a level to be able to be a top three team in the lottery. They just are. Yeah. But also, how are you going to strip it down when it's hard to move everybody? That's what I think the missing piece that a lot of people were missing when they reacted to that. How many tough contracts are there to move? Russ has a no move clause. You can't move Brian Russ. That'd be a nice trade piece, but also he has four years left on a deal that rides into his mid thirties. Same with Ricard Raquel, eight team, no trade clause, four years left on that trade. Uh, on that contract, Malkin and Latang, no move clauses that he inherited. If you're going to strip it down to the bolts, that's going to be included, right? I don't think it should be, but if you're stripping it down to the bolts, some would say there's an option that is off the table right there. No move clauses. Some of it's his doing. Carlson has a no move. Graves has a 12 team. Jari has a 12 team. Achari has an eight team. But that restricts what you can do and how much you can burn it to the ground. 
I, I think that's also a factor. It's not the only factor, but it's also a factor there. So my final thoughts are, this is what you should expect from the Penguins moving forward. They're not going to be a team that is going all in or going for it in 2024-25, um, simply because Kyle Dubas saw what he saw last year and he pivoted. He said, I don't think that I can make this team a championship contender. So he's going to try to do that by retooling however long that takes. And he's hoping that he's able to do it quick enough to where probably not Malkin, but Crosby is still on the team whenever they start to get back into that next era. And you just never know what happens. I mean, you mentioned Brian Rust having a no move. That's up after the season. Maybe it you is. do. Tr- maybe you do trade him after this year. Um, if you really need to, Michael Bunting loses his clause after the season as well. Maybe you get assets for Michael Bunting after the season. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a bunch of forward UFAs. There's a lot of red on their roster right now, actually. So you retool on the fly. Maybe you do this again next year. Maybe you go big game hunting next season for the final year of Evgeny Malkin. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're assuming Sidney Crosby signs a new contract for the later years of Sidney Crosby. Yeah. And you wheel and deal, you go a year at a time. Yeah. Each a year at a time until Sidney Crosby's gone. And then it is, all right, everyone out the door, first round draft picks. Here we go. Or, I mean, maybe this transition becomes a lot smoother than you think because maybe Braden Yeager looks really good. You want to talk about prospects you haven't just you, had, you didn't you didn't mention? Maybe Owen Pickering turns it around whenever he turns pro. Maybe there is some diamonds in the rough in this Penguin system that maybe Tristan Bros does something big. There's mm-hmm. all kind of options that could maybe turn this team into a. How did they get here in the like, mm-hmm. second third round of the playoffs? You never know. <sighs> Hey, I love the optimism. I Thank don't you. quite share it, but I love the optimism. Um, we'll see what the Penguins are able to do. I think it's going to be more towards uh, the beginning of that sentence where it was, you know, they're going to give these guys the opportunity. You know, Beauvillier, Grizzlick, they're of the same ilk, need a fresh start, need to come and do a new situation. But if they succeed, the Penguins should have a half-decent team, especially still led by a Sidney Crosby that's been very good. By led by Chris Letang, that for the most part has been very good. By led by uh, uh, Nevgeny Malkin, that's been for the most part very good. If those guys can step their game up, and meaning the uh, guys that are brought in, Beauvilliers and Lazots and Kevin Hayes, then maybe this team does squeak into the playoffs, but that's not going to be the goal, as stated by Kyle Dubas. The goal is to try to build from the ground up a contender and hope that it coincides with the team that is still currently trying to hang on. But let's finish this episode off by asking one simple question for what, what is the biggest piece remaining for the Pittsburgh Penguins this off season as, as of right now, they have uh, about $4.29 million remaining, according to cap friendly, who we're going to shortly stop being able to reference. What do you think is that biggest piece remaining? The biggest piece of the puzzle that they still need to go out and get someone to play with Sidney Crosby. Yep. Uh, Brian Russ is going to be there. He's going to be perfectly fine. If you have to start the season with Drew O'Connor, all right, fine. And yeah, maybe it's it, it it'll feel a bit like um, Sheary and Gensel 2.0 almost. Whereas there's an obvious piece next to him. Who's the other guy? Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, I'm pretty sure I got the name wrong. It was Sheary and someone else. But it, or even Kunitz Dupuis. It's oh, Kunitz is a good option. I mean, Dupuis good, but I mean. First line good. Uh, so I think that's how that'll feel. Um, so you don't hate it, but you wish there was something more there, i.e., thank you, Josh Yoey, for saying the Penguins uh, gave an offer to Vladimir Tarasenko. Mm-hmm. It, that doesn't mean they're not getting him. It just means at the moment things are uh, on hold. We'll see where that goes. That's a name that could fit somewhere in the lineup to help Sidney Crosby. I know he's a right side. They're kind of looking for a left, but... Maybe if, if that's a guy you get next thing you know, you got to hit some shuffle buttons. You got to start making other moves. Uh, it's yeah. a long offseason ahead. It's only July 2nd. And the biggest piece right now is getting a left winger or someone to play with Sidney Crosby and, and a 1B to what's next uh, get Sidney Crosby his contract. Yeah, obviously there was a report from David Pagnota that they had been talking and things had been moving along, but don't be surprised if it doesn't happen today. Yeah. Uh, Crosby's being patient with it. Dubas is being patient with it, but I think both sides know that there's going to be a deal done. The other thing that Pagnota said is three-year deal, which, by the way, we've been talking about on this show 
for <laughs> multiple, multiple months. Uh, but no, the Tarasenko thing is interesting. If you look at daily faceoffs projections, two years, $4.15 million. That is under what the Penguins currently have remaining Shits. under their salary cap. And that's if they don't even move on from a guy like Eller that would open up some space, like a guy like Jari, which would open up a lot of space, but obviously create a massive hole for the Pittsburgh Penguins in the goaltending ranks. Tarasenko had 23 goals, 55 points, and 76 games played, not to mention he was a big piece to the Florida Panthers' Stanley Cup run. You know, I like that Yoey said the Penguins made an offer. The question is going to be, what does Tarasenko want? He just won the Cup, yeah. so does he, does he want that feeling again, right? He's a two-time Cup champion, 2019 with St. Louis, and now last season with Florida. Or does he want some money and want to want to go to a fun situation? You know, you mentioned he plays the right side. You're not moving Brian Rust away from Sidney Crosby. And right now you need a left guy. Maybe you move. We talked about this before the show. Maybe you move a Ricard Raquel up to play with Crosby, who he's sometimes played his best hockey with in Pittsburgh with Crosby. And for the first time in what seems like his entire career, Evgeny Malkin gets a Russian winger that's able to score goals. I mean, Sergei Plotnikov was supposed to be that. Uh, Certainly didn't work out there. But, you know, you bring in a bona fide goal scoring Russian winger for Evgeny Malkin. I'm sure the, you know, Gino wouldn't be too disappointed at that either. That'd be a good, that'd be a good one. That's, uh, there's another connection there. But like I said, that, that's kind of the thought process I had is if you, uh, let's say you sign and bring in um, Tarasenko, then maybe you do just have to hit the shuffle button and make other moves to maybe finally make a trade to add that mm-hmm. winger to play on the left side of Sidney Crosby. Maybe you maybe you do go with Ricardo Kell on the left side. I mean, one of the big themes of last training camp was these guys are going to play their off wings. These guys are going to be able to play both sides because we're going to need that flexibility. Mm-hmm. I don't remember Raquel's portion of that, uh, but I'm sure he spent time on the left side too if he needed to. So mm-hmm. there's going to be flexibility there. Maybe that's the same game going into this camp too. Maybe it is you're going to play your off wing every so often. Get used to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's obviously going to be – uh, a name to watch is Vladimir Tarasenko. Yeah. Most of the 10 names that we put out there as far as, you know, the 10 names to watch have been taken off the board. Some of them before free agency even opened. Sorry. My Max Domi dreams had been shattered before, you know, July 1 even came around. But the other thing that Kyle Dubas might end up doing, and he mentioned it yesterday, is he he could probably search the trade market and try to find somebody there. Because one, you know what contract you're going to get the guy on. Two, you might be able to do something like the Kevin Hayes contract where they're trying to get rid of a guy. You can maybe even get something else in return and you're not going to have to give up too much by way of, you know, looking at your own assets. I don't know. The one name that is still standing out as a huge name that would certainly look good alongside Sidney Crosby. And this is, again, this might be a, I need to readjust my expectations of the Penguins considering where they're at as an organization, especially their on ice product going into next season. Nikolai Ehlers is said to be, packaged with record majority in certain oh. trade packages that is a good enough prospect to where i'm saying all right some of these draft picks can go out the door if you're bringing in record majority with nikolai ehlers but again that price is probably unrealistic whatever that price ends up being from winnipeg is probably unrealistic and a little bit too high for kyle dubas's uh, appetite ah, can we offer you a slightly used lars eller <laughs> yeah i think uh I, I think the, the Winnipeg Jets will just right away. Ehlers and McGordy for Lars Eller. That's, that's, that's I think that's, well, that gets I, it done. And, and picks, probably a first, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably you know, first. Oh, I was, I was so close to saying it. Thank goodness I didn't. I was so close to saying, go oh, take Tristan Jari. Oh, wait. Nope. You're set there. Yeah. You're they're set. good there with the Vezina Trophy winner. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cause they're not going to take Ryan Graves and uh, that's it. I just don't see Ricard Raquel getting moved yet either. So there you have it. Yeah, that's, I mean, again, that's a pipe dream. I think more realistically would be them trying to go out there and get Vladimir Tarasenko. I'm trying to look up the Utah uh, Hockey Club because they did a lot of work on their defense yesterday. You know, I just thought it was funny that everybody said, you know, Utah, perfect place for Ryan Graves. They don't care. They don't have any defensemen. Well, they got guys that are a little bit higher quality. You know, Mikhail Sergachev, they overpaid Ian Cole. I mean, Jesus, $3.1 million yeah. for Ian Cole. But picked up Just, John Marino. But John Marino as well. They still have Sean Dersey. I, 
they did a pretty good job with their defense. I don't think, you know, dumping off Ryan Graves uh, was ever going to be a possibility for them considering what they were able to pull off. So uh, interesting moves from Utah. Also, last thing I'll leave you with, if you're mad about Matt Grizzlick at 2.75, at least it is not Ian Cole at 3.1. How about at least it's not a 34-year-old for six years? There's also that. Just saying. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll, that. I'll leave the air of mystery and who that is. Yeah. But... <laughs> well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Tip of the Iceberg. Obviously, we will be back tomorrow with a live stream around 4 o'clock Eastern and on Thursday at morning with a full episode of Tip of the Iceberg, breaking down more of what we saw yesterday and hopefully some more moves as free agency continues to unfold. But that's it for this one. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you.